Everyone's here, so we just received the message that we're ready to get started. So let's call the case of United States versus Kara Bassett. My name is Judge Falkenstein. Scoring judges, please look to the two bottom uh, buttons on the le lower left of your screen and make sure you turn off both your uh, video and your audio. These should remain off until the end of trial. You should also have your video set to hide all non-video participants. This means the only people on the screen right now should be the advocates and me. Okay, looks like we're ready to go. Uh, attorneys, you can turn on your volume and can you please make appearances? Hello, Your Honor. My name is Sydney Gaskins. I'm joined here today by my co-counsel, Mr. Ethan Hudson. Good morning. Together we represent the United States government. Defense. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Bree Goodchild, and I'm joined by my co-counsel, Mr. Keen Nolan. Good morning, Your Honor. And today morning. we represent the defendant, Kara Bassett. Okay, before the government, or before we hear opening statements from each party, everyone should make sure they are now in speaker view. That button is in the upper right part of your screen. Attorneys, please remember to mute your audio when the other attorney is speaking. Yes, Your Honor. We do have a, fruit, a few pretrial matters to get to before we begin with opening statements. Sure, let's hear them. First, permission to invoke Rule 615, which is the constructive sequestration of all witnesses barring party representatives. Any objection, defense? None, Your Honor. We would like to note that our defendant will be present in court today, but has elected not to testify. Okay, that sounds good. Anything else? Yes, Your Honor. We'd also like to draw your attention to two pretrial matters in this case. They're going to be on page one of your casebook. First, pretrial order number six. It states that opposing counsel and myself are able to display exhibits that are already in evidence without asking permission of Your Honor first throughout the course of today's trial. And that goes hand in hand with pretrial order seven that says exhibits four through 33 are pre-admitted and may be used at any time by either myself or Ms. Goodchild. The reason that we bring that to Your Honor's attention is because we do intend to be putting exhibits up on the screen throughout the course of today's trial that may be traditionally haven't been moved into evidence yet, but are pre-admitted. Okay, that sounds reasonable. Anything else? No, Your Honor. We're ready to proceed with opening statements. Are there any pretrial matters from defense? Yes, Your Honor. Due to our digital format, we would like to ask your preferences for when we're laying foundation for exhibits that are not already entered into the evidence with the witnesses. Are we allowed to show that on the screen and share it uh, constructively redacted from the jury's view in order to properly lay that identification? That's no problem. Just make sure you ask that it's constructively redacted. And when you want to publish it to the jury, once foundation has been laid and it's been admitted, just make sure to ask for that. Of course, Your Honor. And with that, the defense is ready to proceed as well. Okay, sounds good. At this time, everyone, make, please make sure that your screens are on speaker view. Your Honor, before I begin with my opening statement, I do need your help with something. I can't figure out how to hide the non-video participants. No problem. So if you go to your video settings and choose video settings, under video, there's um, under meetings, there's a little checkbox for hide non-video participants. Great, thank you so much, Your Honor. No problem. Whenever you're ready, you may proceed. May it please the court. This is Don Clark. He was a husband, a father, a businessman. But about three years ago, he was murdered. He was murdered on his own property. 
he was murdered by his own wife, the defendant, Kara Bassett. But first, I want to take a step back and talk to you about who these people are. You see, you're going to learn today that the victim and the defendant, they had been married for about seven years. And together, they owned a zoo. And at that zoo, there were a bunch of elephants, about 16 of them. And oddly enough, in today's trial, the elephants are actually a really important part of this case. Because you're going to hear today that the defendant loved elephants more than anything. And when the zoo wasn't being run the way that she wanted to, like a sanctuary where the elephants could roam free, she started to get angry at her husband because he was the one who was in charge. And now at no point in today's trial are we going to say that it's a bad thing to love animals. It's not. But for this defendant, it was different. You see, this defendant didn't just love animals. You're going to hear today a specific quote from this defendant where she said that she was willing to take someone to their grave because she would do anything for these elephants. And that's exactly what happened. On August 18th of 2017, this defendant took a syringe filled with care fentanyl, put it into her husband, put his body into his own van, drove him to a swamp, dumped him there, left him there, and then left that van at an airport near her house. But we can't just say that. We have to prove it. And the way that we're going to prove our case today is by asking you to do something that's actually really simple. We're going to ask you to follow the defendant's footsteps. We as the government, we bear the burden of proof in today's trial. We're the ones who have to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant murdered her husband. And what that means is we have to prove to you that the defendant intentionally and deliberately killed Don Clark. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to meet our burden by calling one witness to the stand, Ms. Steph Johnson, the FBI agent, the lead investigator on this case. And she's going to take the stand today and take you step by step through her investigation and really get you to follow the defendant's footsteps. Now, our case, it's going to be based on three crucial pieces of evidence. The syringes, the van, and the boots. So first, Steph Johnson's going to talk to you about those syringes. Because on August 18th, 2018, there were two things that went missing. The victim and one syringe of elephant tranquilizer. And then Steph Johnson's going to walk you through the defendant's footsteps from the beginning to the middle to the end, the night that the victim disappeared. From the property to the swamp to the airport. And lastly, Steph Johnson's going to talk to you about the boots. And listen carefully about those boots because they are key to this case. And you can't follow the defendant's footsteps without the shoes that the defendant was wearing. You see, you're going to learn today that those boots, they had algae on them, but not just any type of algae. This algae was a match to the same type of algae that was found at the swamp. Now at the end of today's trial, I'm going to speak with you again. And I'm going to walk you through all of the evidence that's presented. And we're going to follow the defendant's footsteps. Because when you do, this case is actually pretty simple. Now Miss Goodchild's going to get up here in a moment and she's gonna say a few words. But while she's speaking, I want you to focus on something and remember it throughout the course of today's trial. Don't let Miss Goodchild put anyone else in the defendant's shoes. 
Now, at the end of today's trial, I'll ask you to find the only conclusion that the evidence is going to support and that the law is going to require. Find the defendant guilty of murder. Thank you. Thank you. Opening from defense. May I proceed? You may. Members of the jury, I'll wipe him off the face of the earth. He doesn't know who he's messing with. He deserved to die. Now, these are the words of someone with a vendetta, of someone who was angry, of someone who had enough. But most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to hear today that these weren't the words of Kara Bassett. No. These were the words of someone the FBI never investigated. Today, you're going to learn about Lisa Clark, the deceased, bitter, and resentful ex-wife. And you're going to learn that she was someone who had every reason to kill her ex-husband. But the FBI never followed her footsteps. You'll hear that in over a year-long search for Don Clark's killer, the government never asked one critical question. On August 18th of 2017, where was Lisa Today, you're going to hear about the relationship between Don Clark and his ex-wife. You're going to learn that the two had been married for a few years, but had a messy divorce back in 2011. And that for years, Lisa Clark spent harassing and threatening Don Clark's family. That she's filed lawsuits because she was convinced he had cheated her out of money. You're going to hear from multiple sources today that it was never out of character for Lisa Clark to threaten and respond with violent outlashes. But most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, what you're going to hear today is that this isn't new information for the government. Today, you're going to get a chance to hear from the lead FBI investigator who conducted the search for Don Clark's kill. And she's going to have to answer the question, on August 18th, where was Lisa Clark? She won't be able to answer that question. But what you'll hear today is that she knew of Lisa Clark's past. She knew about the threats. She knew about the stalking. She knew that on August 18th of 2017, the day that Don Clark went missing, his ex-wife had been calling and texting, demanding for the two to meet. You're gonna hear today that after hearing all of that evidence of a motive, the FBI chose to do nothing. Now allow me to make something clear. We, the defense, are going to show you evidence in today's trial that Lisa Clark could have been involved in the death of her ex-husband. But as the defense, we hold no burden in this trial. We don't have to call a single witness or prove a single fact today. The burden to prove anything and everything rests in one place, with the government. And they're going to have to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that the only explanation for why Don Clark is no longer with us today is because of Kara Bassett. So you might be wondering, how does Kara Bassett come into all this? You're going to hear today that she's not the criminal mastermind the state would have you believe. She's a grieving wife. Someone whose husband left one night and never returned. Someone that the government never considered a victim.
So after today's trial, I want you to keep some questions in mind. I want you to ask yourself, where was Lisa Clark? Why did the government choose not to investigate her? At the end of today's trial, we'll see if these are questions the state is able to answer. At the end of this trial, we'll ask that you follow the evidence, that you find Kara Bassett not guilty of murder. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Now, before the government calls its first witness, I'll ask everyone to switch to gallery view. That button's at the top right of your screen. That'll allow you to see both the advocates and the witnesses at the same time. Okay, government, whenever you're ready. At this time, we call Steph Johnson to the stand. Hello, could you please introduce yourself to the members of the jury? Good morning, my name is Steph Johnson. What do you do for a living? I'm a senior special agent with the FBI. What is your background? Well, I've been an agent for almost two decades. I've been a senior special agent since 2012. What do you specialize in? I work mainly in the Violent Crimes Division. I've done over 100 investigations with the unit. How did you get involved in this case? I was the lead investigator into the disappearance of a Tallahassee resident named Don Clark. Mr. Clark was 38 years old at the time he was reported missing by the defendant, Carabas. And when was Don Clark reported missing? That was August 25th, 2017. I started my investigation the same day, as soon as I learned about the report. Were you able to figure out when Don Clark actually went missing? Yes. According to the defendant, that was August 18th but she waited a week to report him missing. Now I want to give the jury some context. How do you usually go about cases like these? Well, every case has two major steps, the how and the why. First we find out how a crime happened, then why it happened. Those are the steps we followed for this investigation. I want to take your investigation one step at a time, starting with how it happened. How were you able to figure out what happened in this case? We started by looking for evidence and then following where the evidence took us. That started with the search of the Greater Tallahassee Elephant Park, and that was where Mr. Clark and the defendant lived. When you got to the Elephant Park, what happened next? Well, there were three crucial pieces of evidence we considered while searching the park. And that was the syringe, the van, and also a pair of boots. I want to take those pieces of evidence one by one. So let's start with the syringe. Would you recognize the syringe if I were to show it to you today? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Hudson, can you throw up exhibit 19 that's already in evidence for us? What are we looking at here, Ms. Johnson? Uh, this looks like a log of the syringes kept at the park. What was significant about this log to your investigation? Well, as you can see, the log actually notes that there should have been 24 syringes still at the park. But when we searched the property, we only uncovered 23. Did you ever ask the defendant about that missing syringe? Uh, we did. She told us she keeps extremely close logs of these syringes, but she couldn't explain where it went. Why does the defendant keep an extremely close log on those syringes? According to our interview with her, just a few drops of those syringes could kill an adult male. What is in those syringes? That's carfentanil, elephant tranquilizer. And Ms. Johnson, I want to move to the second piece of evidence that you talked about, that van. Could you explain what you mean by that? Of course. Well, when we first got to the park, the defendant informed us that the victim's car was missing. And we searched for it around the area and eventually found it at a private airport a few miles away. Were you able to figure out where that van was the night that the victim disappeared? Yes, ma'am. The van came with a GPS tracker. 
Would you be able to walk the jury through where that van was on August 18th? Yes, ma'am. I even brought along a map to make it easier. And Mr. Hudson, can you throw up what's already in evidence as Exhibit 31? What is this? Well, this is a map of the Elephant Park leading to Big Gum Swamp on a path. Where did the van start? Well, as you can see, it starts at the Tallahassee Elephant Park at 11.17 p.m. Then where does it go? According to the GPS, they left the park at that time and were in motion until 1.26 a.m. where they ended up at Big Gum Swamp. Did you ask the defendant about this van? I did. The defendant told us that it was kept around the park and regularly used for activity for the elephants. And were you ever able to figure out where that van went after it went to Big Gum Swamp? We did. After it parked at Big Gum Swamp, it departed and traveled to an airport located close to the Tallahassee Elephant Park. And what is Big Gum Swamp? The Big Gum Swamp is a pretty popular hunting area, especially because of the gators. Now, after the van arrived at the airport, did you conduct a search of that airport? Oh, we did. That's where we found the van. Now, I want to move to the third piece of evidence that you looked at in this case, the boots. Would you recognize the boots if I were to show them to you today? Yes, ma'am. What are we looking at here? These are a pair of boots the defendant confirmed were hers. What was significant in your investigation about the defendant's boots? Well, a forensic report was conducted revealing that there was mud on those boots matching the mud found at Big Gum Swamp. Would you recognize that forensic report if I were to show it to you today? I would. We have on the screen what's already in evidence as Exhibit 5. Ms. Johnson, what is this document? Uh, this is the forensic report of the boots spelling out that the mud on those boots likely originated from Big Gum Swamp. After you found out that these boots had algae on them that was a match to Big Gum Swamp, what was the next step in your investigation? Well, the next step was speaking with the defendant to find out if these were her boots, if they'd been at the park the night that Mr. Clark disappeared. Did the defendant ever confirm whether or not she had been at Big Gum Swamp? She did. We asked her if she'd ever been to the swamp and she told us she hadn't. Ms. Johnson, I do want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the second part of your investigation, the why this happened. Can you go into detail about your investigation into why? Well, we found a, uh, or we received a letter from Mr. Clark's attorney giving us some information as to why we believe this crime might have been committed. Would you recognize a copy of that document from the attorney if I were to show it to you today? Yes, ma'am. We're throwing up on the screen what is already in evidence as the attorney document. What is this? This is a letter from Mr. Clark's attorney explaining a, uh, the power of attorney he had at the time of his disappearance. What is power of attorney? Not just basically who takes control of your assets if you die unexpectedly. And what does this document say? This document says that in the case of Mr. Clark's disappearance or his death, the defendant would have control over everything. Were you ever able to talk to the defendant about the relationship that she had with her husband? Yes, ma'am. What did you learn? Uh, we learned that they had some disagreements about how the park should be run. Like what? According to the defendant, her husband wanted the sanctuary to be a business, but the defendant disagreed about how the animals should be treated and the kind of activities that should happen at the park. Was the defendant ever able to exercise that power of attorney? Yes, ma'am. 
a couple months after Mr. Clark disappeared, it was October, the defendant took control of the park. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Nothing further. Cross from defense. Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, Agent Johnson. Good morning. I'd like to first start by talking about your knowledge of Lisa Clark. Now, I actually want to talk a bit more about that letter you had from Don Clark's attorney. Now, you'd recognize that if I put it back up on the screen for you, wouldn't you? I sure would. Mr. Nolan, if you would, please. Now, I want to talk a bit more about the start of that letter. You were informed about Don Clark's ex wife I was. You were aware that they got a divorce in 2011. Yeah, that's right. It was a messy divorce. Yeah, that's what we uncovered. In 2015, she filed a lawsuit. Yes, ma'am. She made accusations that Don Clark had hidden assets. That's what we learned. That she didn't get her fair share in the divorce settlement. That's correct. Agent Johnson, you'd agree with me that you were told that this was a form of harassment. Uh, that's correct, ma'am. It's common the case in a messy divorce. That Lisa Clark was prone to outbursts. Yes, that's what we learned. Objection to lack of foundation. May I be heard? You may. There is no foundation on the record as to how this witness would know that Don Clark's ex-wife was prone to outbursts. May I respond, Response? Your Honor? You may. This is actually a line contained in Exhibit 4, a piece of evidence that's already been admitted into evidence that the witness clearly has knowledge of. It's specifically in the bottom, or the second to last paragraph. This is information that was told to Agent Johnson. So thus, we're talking about her personal knowledge based on the information she had. May I and, and this is, you may. The issue with the question was the form of it. The way that Ms. Goodchild is formulating the question is to ask this witness whether or not they know if this person had outbursts. Now, it would be a different story if Ms. Goodchild would reference the document and say that this document says that Lisa had outbursts, but that wasn't the form of the question, hence why I objected to lack of foundation. They respond to that. Sure, briefly. This line of questioning is asking Agent Johnson on the knowledge she has about Lisa Clark coming from this document. Since this is a line clearly contained within the document, that's enough to establish the witness's personal knowledge. I think the government's uh, issue is just how she knows that. If you could just clarify with your witness that she knows this information from reading this document, then I think we'll have no issue with that foundation. Sure, I can rephrase, Your Honor. Thank you. Agent Johnson, you were told in this letter that Lisa Clark was prone to outbursts. Yes, ma'am. You were told that she would often threaten Don Clark. And that's what the letter says, yes. You were told that Don Clark even considered getting a restraining order because of Lisa Clark's actions. According to the letter, yes. Now I want to talk a bit more about the next time Lisa Clark came up in your investigation. Now you'd agree with me that you actually spoke with Kara Bassett about Lisa Clark, right? Yes, we did during one of our interviews with the defendant. During this interview, Ms. Bassett told you that Lisa Clark harassed her as well. That's right. You were told that she would show up to their house. That's correct. You were told that she wouldn't leave Don Clark alone. And that's what the defendant said. The defendant told you that after years after this divorce had happened, Lisa Clark was stalking her husband. Yes, ma'am. Objection to hearsay. May I be heard? You may. To the statements of the defendant that Lisa Clark was stalking her husband, Ms. Goodchild is clearly using this statement, an out-of-court statement, to prove the truth of the matter asserted that Lisa Clark was actually stalking, because that's the basis of her whole case, that she's trying to put this on Lisa Clark. It's not her party opponent, and therefore she can't cite 801D2 either. Response? 
Yes, Your Honor, we're actually not using this line of testimony to prove the truth of the matter asserted. While it is the defense's position that Lisa Clark could have been involved in this murder, this line of question isn't going to prove those facts. It's being used to show that the lead FBI agent in this case was told that the deceased ex-wife had been stalking and harassing him for years. And even after knowing all this information, she never conducted a formal investigation of Lisa Clark. But after knowing that she had a motive and had a past behavior for violence, she never followed up on that lead. We're not using this for the truth of the matter asserted. It doesn't matter if that information is true. What matters is that the state had information and chose not to act on it. It's attacking the credibility of the government's investigation. May I respond? Yes. Your Honor, Ms. Goodchild's entire case rests on these statements being true. She's trying to pin this on an alternate suspect. And the fact that Lisa Clark was apparently stalking, according to the defendant's statements, is absolutely being offered for the truth of the matter. May I respond, Your Honor? Sure. In this case, it doesn't actually matter whether the defendant's statements in this instance were true. The FBI and the government had the burden of proof, and this is a lead that they had the burden to follow up on. The fact that the FBI agents were aware that there was someone else who might have had a reason to attack Don Clark, but chose not to do further investigation on that person, attacks the credibility of their case and shows that they didn't follow all possible leads. That's the relevance of this line of questioning. It's not going for the truth of the matter asserted. I'm going to overrule it, but give a limiting instruction to the jury that this is only for the effect on the listener and not for the truth of the matter. You may proceed. I'll ask that again for you, Agent Johnson. You were told by Kara Baskett that after years after the divorce had passed, Lisa Clark was still stalking Don Clark. That's true. Well, let's talk about the next time Lisa Clark came up in your investigation. You'd agree with me that you were able to look at phone records from Don Clark on August 18th of 2017. Yes, ma'am. You were able to see who he was in contact with. That's right. You saw that Lisa Clark had called him. That's right. That she had texted him. Uh, that's correct. She even texted him after he had disappeared. You saw that on August 18th, Lisa Clark told him they needed to meet up. That's right. That they needed to finally settle their issues. Yes, ma'am. So Agent Johns, I want to talk about what you did with all this information. Now, you'd agree with me that you were never able to determine an alibi for Lisa Clark on August 18th. Well, that's correct, ma'am. We weren't given the opportunity to speak with Ms. Clark, but no evidence indicated she was at the premises the night Mr. Clark disappeared. Well, I want to talk a bit more about what it means to not have an alibi. Your Honor, may we show Agent Johnson a demonstrative aid? Sure. Mr. Nolan, if you would. Agent Johnson, can you see that all right? I can. Now I want to talk about what you know about Lisa Clark on August 18th. All right. May you tell us what she was doing that day? No, we didn't get that information. You can't tell us who she was with? No, ma'am. You can't tell us if she met with Don Clark that day. And that's right. Agent Johnson, you can't tell us if Lisa Clark ever went to Big Gum Swamp. That's correct. Agent, you can't tell us where was Lisa Clark. No, ma'am. All we know is that there were no sightings of her at the sanctuary the night Mr. Clark disappeared. Agent, you'd agree with me that you never conducted a formal interview of Lisa Clark? I would agree we never conducted a formal interview, but we thoroughly investigated the possibility. You talked to her on one occasion? That's right. You told her you had some questions about the disappearance of her ex-husband? That's correct. Lisa Clark told you she hoped he had been killed. Objection to hearsay to the statements of Lisa Clark. Response. 
Again, Your Honor, we're not using this to prove the truth of the matter asserted. It doesn't matter whether Lisa Clark actually wanted him dead. It matters that the Lisa Clark said suspicious statements to the lead FBI investigator about wanting Don Clark to have passed, and yet they still chose not to investigate her as a potential lead. Overall. Agent Johnson, Lisa Clark told you that she hoped Don Clark had been killed. Yes, ma'am. She told you that he deserved to die. And that's what she said. Thank you for your time. I have nothing further. Any redirects? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Hudson, can you throw back up Exhibit 4 for us? Ms. Johnson, I want to follow up on what Ms. Goodchild asked you about harassment by Lisa Clark. Did you ever find any evidence that Don Clark filed a restraining order against his ex-wife? We found no evidence of that. Well, so let me ask you, did you ever find any evidence that Don Clark filed a restraining order against the defendant? Yes, ma'am. We found evidence that Mr. Clark had filed for an order of protection against the defendant. Why? Under 403, substantially more prejudicial than probative. Response? Yes, Your Honor. First of all, we're referencing statements in Exhibit 4 that are already in evidence. But if I were to respond to the 403 objection, the probative value of this testimony that Don Clark filed a restraining order of domestic violence against the defendant in the months leading up to his disappearance, the probative value of that substantially outweighs any danger of unfair prejudice. May I respond, I'm Your going Honor? To, sure. To clarify the objection, it's not to the restraining order against Lisa Clark mentioned in Exhibit 4. It's to the restraining order specifically against Kara Bassett. Since this was an order that was never actually put in place and never actually official, there's an, a substantial unfair prejudice against the defendant in this case that doesn't have the probative value since the order wasn't put in place. May I respond? And just so I'm, just, well, let me ask a question real quick because I don't have Exhibit 4 in front of me. Does Exhibit 4 mention the restraining order against Kara Bassett specifically? Yes, Your Honor. It mentions it briefly but doesn't go into the specific details that it sounded like Agent Johnson was about to get into. May I respond? Well, I don't, be sure. We're not gonna be going anywhere outside of the scope of Exhibit 4 for this testimony. And this witness is not going to be testifying to anything that there's no foundation for. As long as you stay within what the exhibit that's already admitted into evidence says, there's no problem. Defense, feel free to re-object if you feel that she's going beyond what the exhibit says and is trying to explain anything beyond just what is listed in Exhibit 4. Ms. Johnson, what was Don Clark seeking protection against when he filed a restraining order against the defendant? Well, he was seeking protection against the defendant, that she couldn't come within a certain proximity of his person. And why? Well, because he feared that she could cause him physical harm. Thank you. Nothing further. Are there any other witnesses from the government? No, Your Honor. At this time, we rest our case in chief. We ask that Ms. Johnson be allowed to step down. Yes, you may step down. Defense, would you like to call your first witness? Yes, Your Honor. The defense calls Joe Quang to the stand. You're sworn in. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon, sir. 
Could you please introduce yourself to the members of the jury? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joe Manuel Kwong, with a, with a K, Kwong. What do you do for a living, sir? I uh, produce reality television, actually. So I made documentaries and reality TV. They go up on Netflix. They go out into Sundance Film Festival. Uh, you know, I'm a producer. How long have you been doing this type of work? Oh, long time. Years and years. What type of documentaries do you like to make? Uh, I'd say I like to make kind of unusual documentaries. Back in uh, the early 2000s, I made one about a uh, museum opening in New York. Um, chefs, uh, sea fish. You know, I, I think honestly it comes down to the fact that as a producer, you find the strange spots and there tend to be good stories there. Mr. Kwong, I'd like to focus on one of your most recent documentaries. Sure, sure. Elephant Queen. Elephant Queen, right. What this work is about? Yeah, this is um, a documentary that I was filming down in Tallahassee, Florida about a private zoo owned by two individuals who uh, owns a lot of elephants on their property. Who were these individuals? Uh, it was Cara Bassett. She was the elephant queen, name of the show, and uh, her husband, Don Clark, who uh, later he disappeared. So um, now it's just Cara. When did you start working with this couple? So they called me in 2015 to see if I might be interested in making a documentary. Uh, we had some initial conversations and that turned into a deal. How much time did you spend with Kara Bassett and her husband? Uh, all the time, you know, I um, would go there, I'd film five days a week so from, you know, eight in the morning, six in the evening. I'd say I got about 2000 hours worth of film there. Did you get to know the couple at all? Very well, I'd say, yeah. Now, Mr. Kwan, during your interactions with the couple, did you ever see them become violent with each other? I see them become violent with each other? No, nothing like that. Did you ever hear Miss Bassett threaten her husband? I, I don't remember threatening him, no. All right, well, I'd like to turn your attention to August 18th of 2017. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Can you tell us how that day started for you? August 18th, that was the day that um, Dom went missing. For me, it started like a normal day. You know, I went in, 8 a.m., I'm following them around with the camera, the camera crew, and that's how it started for me. Did you have a chance to talk with Don Clark that day? Yeah, a few times, um, and at the end of the day, before I went back home. What did you talk with Mr. Clark about? I was talking to him about a trip I was planning, going down to Mexico, doing a scene shoot for uh, another documentary I might start working on. How was Don Clark acting during this conversation? See, I remember that he was um, acting pretty normally and then he got kind of distracted. What do you mean by that, sir? Well, in the middle of the conversation, uh, he looked down at his phone and he got all you know, white in the face, kind of pale, and he said, I need to go deal with this, you know, right now. And he just walked away. Well, after Don Clark walked away, did you ever see him again? Uh, no, that was actually, that was the last time I saw him. Mr. Kwong, I'd like to shift gears a little bit here and talk about Lisa Clark. Is this someone you know? Lisa Clark is Don's first wife before Kara. I know her. Have you ever met Miss Clark? I've seen her around the sanctuary, right? I'm there all the time and she uh, drops in, let me tell you. Have you ever seen her threaten Don Clark? Yes. Can you tell us about that interaction? Well, one stands out in my mind. I remember I was on the scene, I was shooting some of the elephants and the guests she drops by and she's screaming. And uh, I remember she said something about their divorce and then said, I'm gonna wipe you off the face of the earth. And that stuck out at me. Mr. Kwong, do you know where Lisa Clark was on August 18th of 2017? Lisa, uh, God help, I don't know. All right, sir, I wanna talk a bit more about what happened once you returned from that vacation you mentioned. 
Yeah. Okay. Tell us when you came back to the elephant park. So I came back from that vacation about, um, I'd say, you know, a week, week and a half after the disappearance. Well, after Don Clark had disappeared, did you ever have a chance to speak with law enforcement? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Did they ask anything of you? No, it was only a few questions. Um, they asked me a few questions, but I don't remember so much of the details. Did you give them any documents at all? No, nothing from, nothing from my studio. Did you show them any of the footage from your documentary? Um, there were some interviews that I took, but not much of the footage, no. Did the FBI ever ask you about Lisa Clark? About Lisa Clark? Um, no, I don't remember them asking me about Lisa. Thank you for your time, sir. I have nothing further. Ross? Yes, Your Honor. Now, nice. Hold on, where'd she go? Good morning, Mr. Kwong. Good morning, how are you? I'm good, I just have a couple questions for you before we can get you out of here, okay? No worries, ask your questions. Now you're a producer, right? Yes, I'm a, I'm a producer for reality television. You would follow Don Clark and the defendant around with the camera, right? That's right. You would follow them around on their property in Tallahassee, isn't that true? Sure, their property, Tallahassee, maybe sometimes on a few trips they took, but I just, I follow them around, keep a tight shot. On July 17th of 2017, you were filming the defendant and Don Clark, right? July 17th, um, if it was a weekday, yeah. You were filming them when they were having an argument. Isn't that true? Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, I remember this. You heard the defendant tell her husband that she was unhappy with the way the sanctuary was being run, right? Uh, sure, she'd say that actually, uh, you know, a bunch of times. So I don't remember this time in particular, but I do remember that getting said from time to time. You remember that the defendant told her husband that she didn't like the way that he was doing things. Isn't that true? Yes, I remember that. You saw the defendant start to get angry, didn't you? Oh, yeah. You saw the defendant start to get angry when the defendant threw a vase at her husband's head. Isn't I that do, a fact? I do remember that. She threw the vase. Let me tell you, that was a dramatic moment for episode five. The vase shattered on the wall, didn't it? <laughs> After you saw the defendant throw a vase at her husband, she noticed that you were recording, right? That's right. When she noticed that you were recording, she made you delete that footage, didn't she? Yeah, I mean, we had big plans for what to do with that. I told you, this is a dramatic household. We wanted to get it up on the screen, but she made me delete it. That's true. Well, that's a yes. She made you delete the footage, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And after she made you delete the footage, well, about a month later, her husband disappears, doesn't it? It was July, then it was about a month later. You have no idea how the defendant treated her husband when you weren't watching. Isn't that right? Sure, I wasn't there. Now, back in June of 2017, you conducted some interviews with this defendant, didn't you? In June of 2017, sure. I mean, throughout for the last, since 2015, I've been interviewing the defendant. You would recognize some of those interviews if I were to show them to you today. Yeah, I think so. At this point, I'm gonna direct the court's attention to exhibits 36, through 38, their video clips, and I'm gonna authenticate these with the witness. No problem. Is your attention drawn, Mr. Kwong? Yo, what do you want me looking at right here? Exhibits 36 through 38, their footage of your interviews with the defendant. Give me one second. 36, yeah, I, I have them here. They look like footage of um, footage that I took, that's right. And they're fair and accurate copies, right? Uh, I trust that they are, sure. The government moves exhibits 36 through 38 into evidence. Any objection? 
Without objection, Your Honor. They're admitted. Mr. Mr. Hudson, can you throw exhibit 36 on the screen for us? And Mr. Kwong, this looks like one of the videos you took, right? Yeah, that's Kara with her flower crown over there, yeah. Mr. Hudson, can you play it? Hold on, I'm sorry, I can't hear her. I'm having the same problem, give us a moment. No worries, no worries. Mr. Hudson, by chance, are you muted? <laughs> Well, that's okay, Mr. Kwong. I have the transcripts right here, so I can clarify with you with this. Okay, sure. That works for me. This looks to you like the video where the defendant says, zoo exists to make people happy, sanctuaries exist to make animals happy, and people who can't see the difference shouldn't be around animals. Yeah, she's definitely said things like that, for sure. The defendant also said in Exhibit 36, Oh, I'm steaming. This is a business, not a charity. As long as it's my money, we'll run it that way. That's what Dawn said to her. Can you believe that? We'll see how this ends, right? Yeah, um, Dawn would talk about how he owned the business. It was his business. It's not a charity. Mm -hmm. And the defendant was upset with that, right? Yeah. Oh, and yeah. so the defendant said, we'll see how this ends. Isn't that true? Yeah, that's true. And then the defendant says in Exhibit 37 that nothing is more important to her than those animals. Yes or no? Uh, yeah. Now I want to focus on a very specific quote in the last clip that I meant to show you. That's Exhibit 38. The defendant says, I will take people to their grave if I have to. You remember that, don't you? Oh yeah, Carol was a dramatic person. Under the rule of completeness, we would ask that, that the entirety of the quote from Ms. Bassett be read so the jury has the appropriate context to understand what this statement was in regards to. May I respond? Sure. This exhibit is already in evidence in its completeness. I'm drawing a specific attention to this line because it's cross-examination and I'm allowed to do that. Yeah, on redirect, feel free to read the, to complete the portion if you want, counsel, but right now, Council's free to read whatever portions from the exhibit that's admitted. Of course, Your Honor. This defendant told you that she would take people to their graves if she had to, right? Yeah, that's one of those classic Kara quotes. Because she'd do anything to protect those animals, right? Uh, she yeah, that's what she talked about. Now, Mr. Kwong, I want to talk to you about the little investigation that you did. You actually went to Costa Rica yourself, didn't you? I did. Um, that was part of the episode about Don. We wanted to see what we can find at his property there. You wanted to see if Don was in Costa Rica, right? Yeah, we did. So you went to his house. We went to his property, that's true. You went inside his property, right? Door was unlocked, yep. Didn't have permission. <laughs> no, didn't have permission other than uh, to get all access on their lives. And then you looked around, right? In the house, that's true. Mm -hmm. You didn't see any dirty clothes, did you? No, there were some of his clothes hanging in the closet, but they didn't look dirty to me. You didn't see any dirty clothes? Oh, yeah. The place looked super clean, right? Looked clean to me. There were no dishes in the sink. No dishes in the sink. And then you watched this house for about a week, right? I'd come back and visit throughout the week that I was there. That's true. You never saw anybody go inside, right? No, I didn't. You never saw anybody else go outside, right? That's true. To the best of your knowledge, this house was completely vacant. Isn't that true? Yeah, according to what I saw. The last time that you saw Don alive was back in Tallahassee, wasn't it? That's uh, on that conversation that I was talking about before. Mm-hmm. The last time you saw Don alive was back in Tallahassee. Is that a yes to my question? Oh, yeah. That was at the Elephant Park. Right, that's true. 
The last time that you saw Don alive was 6 p.m. on August 18th, 2018, right? Right, that was that conversation I was talking about before. Then you never heard from him again? No, I didn't. Thank you, nothing further. Any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Kwong, I'd just like to clarify a little bit about what you were talking with Ms. Gaskins about. Now, okay. on August 18th of 2017, did you notice any fights between Don Clark and his wife? Uh, no, not that I remember on August 18th, no. Well, how about in the week leading up to August 18th? Did you see them fight at all then? Um, not that I remember, no. Had you heard Miss Bassett ever threaten her husband during that time? During the week before? No, I didn't hear anything like that, no. Thank you, sir. I have nothing further. You may step down, sir. Thank you. Have a You're good day, welcome. everybody. We will now hear closing arguments from each party. Uh, everyone should please switch back to speaker view. Also, this since both witnesses- scoring, scoring judges talking. Can I have a three minute break to take my Labrador retriever outside? Um, he's quite sure. old and this will cause a sanitation problem. So- No problem. Let's take a we'll brief the break. A couple minutes. So can we take three to five minutes? No problem. Just let me know when you're back. Excellent. Thank you very much. In the meantime, all other judges, if you could make sure that you change your screen to speaker view and I'll do the same once it's time. And then since witnesses have already testified, judges feel free to score them on your ballots at this time. I am back. In human years, he is 84. So when it's time to go, it's Great. time to go. Great. So at this time, everyone, please make sure you're on speaker view. Okay, closings from the government. Yes, Your Honor. I'm sorry. May it please the court, the saddest part 
It might be that Don Clark saw this coming. A couple months before he disappeared, he files a restraining order against his own wife. He's scared that the defendant is going to hurt him. Domestic violence. About two months later, she does. The defendant kills him. He dies at 38 years old because this defendant decided that her husband was worth more to her dead than alive. And that's why we charged the defendant with murder. Now we bore the burden of proof in this trial. We had to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant murdered her husband. And what that means is we had to prove to you that the defendant killed her husband intentionally and deliberately. Ms. Goodchild's gonna get up here in a moment and say that it's the highest burden in our criminal justice system and she's gonna be right, but we met it. So let's walk through how we met our burden. Let's do what I asked you to do at the beginning of today's trial. Let's follow the defendant's footsteps from the beginning to the middle to the end because when you follow the defendant's footsteps, they always lead you back to just one place. Right here in this courtroom, to the seat of the defendant. So first, let's start at the beginning. Because what this case really comes down to is what happened the night that Don Clark disappeared. Now you heard today that elephant tranquilizers were logged regularly in the elephant park. So every time somebody took an elephant tranquilizer out of commission, it was logged in this book. Every time that an elephant tranquilizer was taken out of its compartment, it was logged in this book. And it makes sense. It was logged so reliably because tranquilizers, care fentanyl, are super dangerous substances. Even a little bit can sedate an, an elephant, and a lot can surely kill a man. And now on August 18th, 2017, there were two things that went missing. The victim, Don Clark, and one bottle of care fentanyl. And Ms. Goodchild, she wants to get up here and talk about Lisa Clark this, Lisa Clark that, but she couldn't give you an explanation as to why that care fentanyl was missing. And think about why that is so important. Lisa Clark didn't have access to this care fentanyl. She didn't work at the park, but you know who did? The defendant. The defendant and Don Clark. And Don Clark is the one who's dead. So you know exactly what happened because there's only one thing that could have happened that actually makes any sense. You see, for you to believe what Ms. Goodchild is trying to sell you, it has to be reasonable. It can't just be doubt. And it's not reasonable, reasonable to believe that the fact that this care fentanyl was missing is just some big coincidence. Follow the defendant's footsteps to the middle because we do have to talk about those boots because they are so important. Because you can't really follow the defendant's footsteps without putting yourself in the defendant's shoes. These aren't Lisa Clark's shoes, no. They're the defendant's shoes. And you heard today that these shoes had a very specific part of algae on the bottom of them. And that algae was a perfect match to the algae that was found at the swamp. And now members of the jury, Miss Goodchild can't expect you to believe that that's just one big coincidence. You see, throughout the entire course of today's trial, she didn't address any of the evidence that we brought. She wants to talk about Lisa Clark, who didn't own those boots. She wants to talk about who Lisa Clark, who didn't have access to the van. And she can't have an answer as to why the algae was showing up on the defendant's shoes. I mean, think about it. If this alternate suspect, Lisa Clark, really is responsible for his disappearance, why on earth is this van parked at a swamp at one o'clock in the morning? That doesn't answer anything, but what really makes sense is what we presented to you today that the defendant took her husband's body and dumped it in the swamp, and you heard today that there were alligators in that swamp. 
So follow the defendant's footsteps to the end, to the air park, where the defendant left that van and then returned back. You see, we proved that when you follow the footstep, there's only one person who could have had anything to do with this crime. And it was this defendant. But still, we had to talk to you about why that is. We had to talk to you about the defendant's motive. And if you wanna know why the defendant killed her husband, just look at the defendant's own words because the defendant's own words are the same words that gave this defendant away. I know during the trial, we couldn't present the video evidence for you, but I read it onto the record. This defendant is the one that said that she was going to take someone to their grave. And you heard today that this defendant was conflicted about how her husband was running the sanctuary. She wasn't happy with it. And so that's why she did exactly what she did. And look back to the power of attorney document because that adds to it too. This defendant had all of the motive in the world to get rid of her husband because the second that she did, all of his assets would become hers, that part. She could do exactly what she wanted to do with it. But even so, let's play devil's advocate for a moment. Let's say that what Ms. Goodchild and the defense is telling you is true. That the defendant has nothing to do with it. That this was all just one big coincidence. I mean, I want you to think about how absurd that is. Because you're allowed to question the defense's theory of the case. Think about all of the things that a reasonable person would have done. In the circumstances where they think, oh my goodness, my husband is missing. So the first day her husband's missing, does she call the police? No. Second day, does she call the police? No. Third day, does she call the police? No. Fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, does this defendant call the police? No. So come to the only conclusion that the evidence supports and the law requires. Find the defendant guilty of murder. Thank you. Closing argument from defense. Members of the jury, I'm going to wipe him off the face of this earth. He doesn't know who he's messing with. He deserved to die. These are the words of someone with a motive to attack Don Clark. The words of someone who wanted to hurt him. The words of someone who had reached their breaking point. Most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, these aren't the words of Kara Bassett. These are the words of Lisa Clark. Someone who you heard today, the FBI was aware had been harassing and stalking and threatening Don Clark since 2011. Someone with a track record of violent outbursts. Someone that told the FBI agent in charge of this case that she wanted Don Clark dead. But the government chose not to investigate. They chose not to follow her footsteps. And that's why we're here today to ask the question that the FBI should have been asking years ago. On August 18th of 2017, where was Lisa Clark? It's the state's accusations that bring us here today. You see, Ms. Gaskins doesn't just get to make these accusations, she actually has to prove them. She has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the only reasonable explanation for why Don Clark died was because his wife intentionally murdered him. Now allow me to make something clear. As the defense, we've shown you evidence that the state neglected, evidence that Lisa Clark had a violent history and had a motive and reason to harm her ex-husband. We didn't need to bring that. 
We didn't need to prove to you that that's what happened. It was the state's job today to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that Lisa Clark could not have been the murderer. Not something they just weren't able to do today. You see, the government never asked where was Lisa Clark. So we did. Throughout today's trial, we asked all of the witnesses the same question. When I asked the FBI investigator, where was Lisa Clark? Agent Johnson didn't know. When we asked Mr. Kwong, he didn't know. I even posed the question to the government in my opening statement. And they never responded to that question. And there's a reason for that. Because the FBI never did their job. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to direct your attention back to the cross-examination of Agent Johnson. I want you to remember what she told us about Lisa Clark. That on August 18th, she didn't know her alibi. She didn't know what Lisa Clark was doing. She didn't know who she was with. She didn't know if she went to the swamp or met with her ex-husband. She couldn't tell us where Lisa Clark was. And that's a problem. You see, because the state should have known better. Because Agent Johnson told us that she had been told by multiple sources several different times that Lisa Clark had a history of violence and had been stalking Don Clark for years. Agent Johnson told us that she was aware of this information. She knew that Lisa Clark had been making threats against Don Clark's family, that she knew on August 17th, Don Clark received phone calls and text messages from his ex-wife. That his ex-wife told him they needed to meet that evening to finally settle their problems. The same evening that he died. And yet, they still chose not to conduct an investigation. Does that sound like responsible police work to you? Does that sound like something that should have been left to the dust? Members of the jury, the state had an obligation to follow that lead. And the only thing they did was ask Lisa Clark what happened. She told them that she wanted Don Clark dead and they left it at that. Members of the jury, that's not enough. That's reasonable doubt. Now, Ms. Gaskins just told you that it couldn't have possibly been Lisa Clark, but I want you to walk through what happened on August 18th. You heard from Mr. Kwong that when he was talking with Don Clark that day, suddenly he got a text message. He turned white in the face. He looked scared. He said he needed to go, and he suddenly left, never to be seen again. Members of the jury, we know that Lisa Clark texted him that they needed to me. That's reasonable doubt. I want to take a moment to consider the smoking gun that the state tried to convince you of. That because there was some algae on Miss Bassett's boots that she must be a killer. Now they showed you Exhibit 5 during their case in chief, but members of the jury, they left out a pretty important detail. One we're going to show to you today that you can look at when you deliver. They found algae that was in the swamp on her boots, but members of the jury, even more importantly, the government never tested the elephant park to see if they had algae there. Think about what that means. That means that if Miss Bassett was doing her job and walking around her land and stepped in a puddle, well, that algae could have gotten on our boots. And then that algae could have gotten there from anywhere on her property, not from murdering her husband in cold blood. Members of the jury, that's reasonable doubt. When you go back to deliberate, I want you to ask yourselves the questions that the state time and time again failed to answer. Where was Lisa Clark? If it's reasonable that she could have been involved in this, we ask you to find in favor of the defense and find Miss Bassett not guilty. Any rebuttal? Yes.
don't let Miss Goodchild put anyone else in the defendant's shoes. I mean, think back to my cross-examination. Who was violent with Don Clark, the defendant? Who threw a vase at Don Clark's head, the defendant, not Lisa Clark? So find the defendant guilty of murder and follow the footsteps. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, judges at this time, please fill out your ballots and click submit.